<laughs> so good morning america good afternoon europe and good evening from dubai i'm pleased to welcome all of you to today's webinar role of web3 and ai in education let's do the introductions first starting with me my name is sharad agarwal a lot of you already already probably know me because i do so many webinars we've done like 70 webinars in the last 18 months and most of them relate to the web3 uh, space. We cover metaverse, DAOs, tokenization, community building, thought leadership, future of work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's my introduction. Formally, I'm the chief metaverse officer of Cybergear. It's a digital agency. I started, I think, now 27 years back. Yeah, so I'm 27 years in the digital space. That makes me very old, but I'll take that. And um, my other hat is that I'm the founder of Only Webinars. We started this platform when COVID hit because I saw an opportunity to have engaging conversations. And that's why in the last 18 months, we've done so many webinars. Uh, I do recommend our audience to please share your profiles in the chat. Let us know from which part of the world you are coming in from. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A tab. And we'll be happy to take your questions towards the end. So I can already see South Africa, Finland, Switzerland, Hong Kong. We always have a global audience and we love that about, about the audience. All right, so uh, we'll do the introductions, but let me first just very quickly answer why I selected this topic. There's always a reason we uh, choose a topic that resonates uh, with people. And education is, I think, uh, something very important. Uh, when I was studying in school, college, and university, there was no artificial intelligence. In fact, there was no internet, right? There were no mobile phones. And I think we turned out all right. So now we have Web3, we have AI, and the challenge is really how, this can, how these technologies can be used to further education. And, uh, you know, I just read, I guess, this morning that there are a billion kids who go to school every day. One billion kids on this planet go to school every day. 600 million don't have the proficiency in maths and English or in reading. We need to bridge this gap. This is the bigger picture. And this is why this topic of education is so relevant. So that's the stage. I have with me three panelists two on the screen and one is getting his audio set up. He'll be joining us shortly. So uh, he can come in whenever. Uh, so I'm going to start with Melissa to introduce herself and then I'll go to Tom. Both of you are coming in from UK and let's hear from you. Over to you, Melissa. Amazing. What an intro. There's so much there, but I thought you were going to say you're 27. I was like, <laughs> tell me your secret. No, listen, everybody joining from around the world, it's uh, amazing to be connected. I'm Melissa McBride. I'm a career-long educator, uh, rather reluctantly at the beginning. My mom told me I should be a teacher. I told her that would never happen. And look at me now, mom, if you're listening. Um, I've had the pleasure of teaching globally, uh, leading schools, opening schools, including in Dubai, which was my home uh, a number of years ago, and I'm absolutely love going back and spending time there. But what I find myself doing now is really disrupting education. We have a sector, as we know, um, that is 260 years old. There's a huge amount of challenges, but there's a huge amount of potential. And to your point, Sharad, the thing I'm so excited about is how can we use this emerging tech, this disruptive tech to actually reach the kids around the world who have no access or who have had poor quality or poor access. And that is really what motivates me. It, it's what's my why. You know, we've kind of come full circle because the school that I run, Sophia High School, we're now the UK's first, actually we're the, the globally, the only online school that's ever been accredited by the Department for Education. So that's super exciting. And everyone will be pleased to know, the first thing we did is showed those inspectors, here is how you teach in immersive environments. Here is what kids can do when you give them access to tools like AI and the creator's economy. And we're just getting started. So super excited to be here. Thanks for that introduction. Let's bounce to Tom. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much for everyone you know, for being here. 
I am the executive director of the World Engineer Foundation. And actually the World Engineer is the only centralized international day for nonprofits worldwide. And since 2014, it was celebrated by UN agencies and different governments around the world. And recently we established the foundation, which is a philanthropic nonprofit really committed to advancing meta-philanthropy and supporting human-centered NGOs that are making a meaningful impact around the world, um, especially within education. Um, our core focus is advancing meta-philanthropy because the idea is to center the practice of online philanthropic giving and really imagining new alternatives via Web3, AI, gaming, you know, 3D internet, deep tech, AI and beyond. And you know, the reason why this is so interconnected to education is because you know, within the 47 countries that are included in the global philanthropy tracker, and you know, more than $70 billion for a philanthropic contribution was donated in 2020 alone. And when, when education was the most frequently cited cause of, um, of philanthropic support, for me, the private donor, governmental donors. And I think uh, really revolutionizing uh, philanthropic endeavors and philant an online philanthropy, philanthropy for education is vital you know, to connect every child to the internet, to facilitate education for every single child around the world. And you know, I would love to talk about more, <laughs> about this a lot more today, thank you. Well, thanks, Tom. I was uh, reading on your LinkedIn profile that you coined the term meta philanthropy yeah and i think uh, yeah that makes sense uh, so thanks for adding voice and vocabulary uh, mm -hmm. let's go to melissa melissa from whatever i have been reading about web3 and ai at least for the last 18 months um, i am hearing that there is a huge upside of web3 and of course, Gen AI in education. But the question to ask is, how do we go about implementing some of these new technologies? And I think it has to start with the teachers first learning the new technologies before they start educating the children in turn. So we need to train the teacher kind of uh, run a program like that. Do you agree? Is that the starting point? Yeah, I'm delighted you said the starting point needs to be the classroom, right? Rather than policymakers, which is what happens, right? We can iterate policies and then open AI release a new initiative this week, which kind of throws everything out. So yeah, it, it starts with those that are in that classroom, right? And I think I'd add another layer. It's also co-creating this pathway with students uh, and not being afraid that we can facilitate this together on this entirely new paradigm of learning and accessing and creating, you know, and as long as we approach an education with the mandate that we want to do so safely, we want to do so ethically, and we want to do so effectively, I think we can co-create an incredible new pathway. And my experience in working with young people, you know, this yesterday, they were already creating their own GPTs, right, in our school. Um, have the most amazing laboratory to test these things. The immense capacity to look through this as a lens of a tool that helps to decentralize, as a tool that helps to solve challenges, is something that these young people that we're dealing with today, you know, Gen Alpha, but Gen Z as well, um, have that built into their psyche. And I think if we approach it in this way, rather than spend time, huge amounts of time, you know, worrying about the policy and start building it from the ground up, I think we're going to see some incredible things coming through that will help us solve these challenges and give more access to kids around the world. Sure. Tom, I want to come to you. What are the first steps involved for school, colleges, and universities to embrace technology? Well, I, I think I agree with Melissa. I mean, it starts in the classroom. And I think, um, I think for, 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 from our perspective, from our work, a lot of our work has been with the international development. And I think it's important to remember that the classrooms, the universities exist in every single country around the world. And uh, especially, you know, I think, you know, with, within the developing countries, within different regions around the world, where there's not always connectivity to the internet, there's not always access to free education. 
I think it's important to remember, remember that you know AI and Web3 can really revolutionize access to education, access to the internet. And I think um, it starts, like Melissa said, with the educator in the classroom, wherever that classroom may be, whether it's in, in Nigeria or whether it's in the US. And, and I think sometimes, you know, we forget that. And I think it's important that the international community supports that, wherever that may be. Right. I think Martin has managed to solve his acoustic issues. Martin, are you okay now with your sound? Audio is working, Martin? No, I believe so. I can hear you now. Hello, everybody. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, can Good you just you. introduce yourself? We started only five minutes back, so you haven't missed much. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, sure. My name is Martin Krupik. I am uh, an artist and uh, entrepreneur, social entrepreneur, and I run a company called Immersa, and when we deliver autonomous agents, um, AI driven avatars. Yeah, and uh, we focus on uh, customer service, um, employees training, education, and uh, I've been instrumental developing some of the educational uh, content. And we've got an ambitious idea to create create something like a holodeck, if you if you if you like for Star Trek. So that that would be me. Yeah, great. Uh, and I remember when I announced this uh, webinar, Martin reached out to me and said, I have to be on the panel. So here you are today. Thank you for accepting the invite. All right, great. Moving on. Uh, I still want to ask about the curriculum. Uh, do you think, Melissa, that Web3 and AI have to be part of the curriculum in schools? Young kids need to understand the Web3 glossary they need to understand all the jargon and gobbledygook in this industry and not wait till they reach my age to start learning all this stuff. So do you think uh, it makes sense for schools to start using or rather adopting these technologies at this young stage where 10 year olds are, uh, the digital natives are fluent with all the lexicon that exists in our industry? I actually believe it's a fundamental right and necessity, right? If we just look at the world that we currently work in as professionals and actually what's about to, to happen, you know, in, in 2028, 2030 beyond, if we do not begin to open these doors and begin to explore with young people what some of the possibilities are, of course, what some of the dangers are, um, then we're not actually providing with the education that they need for their future. You know, it's about... Um, taking off the shackles and, and not being afraid that yes, there are certainly challenges, you know, we can talk about safeguarding, we can talk about data, but if we reshift that focus back to what is the huge possibilities here, potential, you know, the story looks a lot different. Um, and actually young people, you know, we're, di we're digital dinosaurs, you know, I hate to tell you, but I'd like to say we're probably the cool ones here, all of us on this call and the panelists and also everyone that's watching. But young people are just built differently. You know, I'm a mom of four. So I have four under 14. Um, the nine-year-old is like the baptism of fire. You know what I mean? He is completely next gen. He would rather spend his days building on Roblox Studio than, you know, learning algebraic equations, you know? And actually we have to recognize who they are uh, and actually see that potential. So I, I actually think it's a fundamental right. And if schools are not starting to do it already, then they are failing their kids. Yeah, and I think yeah, before I continue, Tom, um, you know, I think uh, schools need to start experimenting with Web3, with Metaverse. It's so easy to create a virtual classroom in let's say a platform like Spatial. It can be done in a couple of hours, doesn't require too much of an in-depth knowledge. So I think teachers need to start creating these virtual classrooms, invite students to create their avatars, come in and start participating. They learn to navigate, they learn the use of these technologies. So we need to do workshops, hands-on stuff, you know, for kids to start using these technologies rather than it just being taught through a Canva PowerPoint presentation or what have you. So uh, Tom, you wanted to add to this. Yeah. 
I, I wanted to add to that because I think it, it, it should start even before school, even in kindergarten. I just want to highlight, for example, a company like Tiny Taps by Aminoka Brands, where they completely gamified education for toddlers and young kids. And I think like Melissa said, you know, the reality is that we have over 3 billion gamers around the world, which a large proportion of them, very young kids and young adults. And I think, uh, you know, gamifying education from a young age, uh, using Web3 technology, using NFTs, like Tiny Tap has done really leaving the charging dark over the last couple of years, is a great example of how you introduce, you know, Web3 skills, AI skills to, you know, to the toddler, to the young kid, at the language that they can understand. And with the years, you know, uh, the language becomes more proficient, the language becomes more specific. And I think I, I agree with Melissa, at the, end of, at the end of the day, education is that to provide skill set for life and skill set for employment, skill set to, you know, provide for your, for your family, for, you know, uh, for your loved ones. And I think uh, if the education system around the world doesn't incorporate web free and AI, most of the kids coming out of the education system will be left without a necessary skill set to live a, a, a fruitful life in, in the future that is to come. And you know, open AI has completely revolutionized this, uh, the education landscape over the last year. Yeah, agreed, 100%. Martin, you want to add anything to that in terms of the curriculum embracing all the new technologies? Well, uh, I, I believe that uh, technology naturally is progressing. And uh, perhaps when ChatGPT came in, there was a lot of resistance. And nowadays, you might meet people who are actually encouraging um, to, uh, to embrace the technology. What I feel is that um, uh, the uh, it, it used to be a marketing jargon to have something um, safe and um, ethical and so on. Nowadays, it's a, it's a requirement, a regulatory requirement. And I believe that it's important that the uh, language models that we are using are unbiased. So they actually will give us a good um, good information. And I believe that that we are still very early to actually employ and mass uh, these language models. Um, my, my reasoning is that um, what we require is some form of explainable AI. Um, indeed, uh, Mr. Musk has started a company XAI and, and he's going in the right direction. So I would say that uh, the emergency is around uh, the rehaul around the entire uh, educational system that's mostly geared up towards uh, creating employees. I mean, that is my controversial opinion. Uh, it's my opinion and um, uh, so so uh, effectively i believe that uh, the, the, we are we are embracing technologies and um, the, it, it is it is it is important to look at the advantages what generative ai can bring and how how it can help you to create and and, and navigate like uh, with, within our company we've been using the, the gpt uh, models for the past two years way before Chat GPT came on, and I benefited uh, uh, hugely from this. I, I can't imagine life without generative AI, and so so on. Um, whether Web three is going to play part in education, that is that is altogether a whole whole another uh, debate. Uh, I believe that Web three is yet another step in in evolution, and um, yeah, we will see. I personally uh, uh, believe that. Um, the, the the need for overhaul in education is is urgent. Maybe that's where the urgency comes from, and um, I also believe that um, the change for the reward system, rather than having uh, a score system, uh, rather having something that is uh, geared around storytelling, where it entices the participant to then have more uh, thirst uh, for knowledge to quench their desire uh, to learn and their curiosity is something that may help. So and indeed gamifying experiences has proven to be the way forward. Uh, my comment towards the current platforms, I believe we shouldn't rush into creating some substandard uh, educational experiences that could potentially uh, be damaging, like you mentioned spatial, right? So yes, yeah, great platform. All these platforms are great, but like, you know, everyone's trying to like, push it, rush it, 
you know, the, 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 the question is, what is the value that these educational uh, experiences will provide, right? Um, for example, someone created this religious experience and there was such a backlash because it wasn't just uh, great enough. So I would say that we should take it rather easy and collaborate with universities that have been trying to do it. Uh, lastly, I believe that maybe we won't have uh, many brick and mortar uh, places uh, to, to educate already today. There's plethora of uh, online courses and so on. So to me, it will just be a natural, natural evolution towards uh, being able to do home education with uh, augmented reality uh, goggles where the parents are participating. Uh, perhaps uh, the most important part, I believe, in education is the social aspect that it brings uh, for um, for for anyone. Uh, so so to me, um, one of one of the greatest thing in 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 being in a in a in a, in a school is to to meet your future business partners, uh, uh, partners in crime, friends, best friends, partners, and so on. You know, I believe so. Th this is this is perhaps in nutshell. If if you yeah. if you ask me, and uh, <laughs> so there you go. I agree with you. It's early days. And this is an example I often give from my own life. Like I started the first digital agency in the Middle East in 1996. Back then, we used to connect to the internet using dial-up modems, which used to make that irritating sound. In fact, in 98, it was voted as the most irritating sound on the planet. And I grew up connecting to the internet using that irritating sound six times a day. Today, fast forward 27 years, we watch Netflix on the internet, right? With no buffering, zero buffering, seamless. The important point to note is that it has taken 27 long years for technology to evolve from where it was to where it is today. And so it is going to be with Web3, Metaverse, and all of it. Even with AI, it's early days. AI has been there for the last 20 years. Gen AI is new. But look at the pace at which new tools are coming out. Every day I update a document, which right now is 500 AI tools. We started four months back. First document was 50 AI tools, then 100, then 200. Today it's 500. Lord alone knows, maybe in uh, December, we'll touch 1,000 AI tools. So the rate of acceleration is exponential. And it's very important, therefore, for all of us to be totally hooked on, almost like on a 24 by 7 basis, because if you blink, you miss it, right? That's the pace of development. I see two hands raised in the room. I think, Melissa, you raised it first, so I'll come to you and then to Tom. Amazing. You know, what I love to think of is like, what, what are we talking about with Web3? It's, it's multidimensional. But I think for education, it's the ability to learn through experience. And actually, like, that is what the brain is designed to do. It was never designed to be a, a, a passive, uh, you know, sidecar along in the journey. But the industrial model of teaching has asked us to create classrooms that look like that, right? So if we think about Web Web3, whether it's the immersive side of Web3 and like literally stepping onto the pages to create that experience or the ability to learn through simulations, you know, we do a lot of project-based learning where we can use Web3 and the emerging technologies and the disruptive technologies to help A, support students in learning. So we like to think of it as a sage guide you know, it can step in and give them that added skill that they may not have learned yet or that piece of information they need, might need to know. Um, but also to then explore, you know, some of the barriers to learning. Well, I can't really write a book because I'm not an illustrator. Well, we now have tools that allow them to overcome that, right? And then you have this sense of amazing community. And I think that is what we need to be doing, right? Like young kids have communities. I watched my son on Roblox. He has people he's never met. He knows how to navigate them safely, but they're part of his community, right? So that is what the creator's economy and Web3 is really all about. And our kids are already there. We need to stop being so afraid. You know, yes, we're afraid of parents and yes, educators are afraid. But look at, you know, what can we do? There was a question that came up about um, 
you know, putting in barriers. And what I always say is, look, when we're parents and you're teaching children to navigate stairs, to ride a bike, to cross a street, to then go out on their own, you know, without a parent, we don't do so without putting in some uh, side rails, you know, or bumpers or that, that type of approach. And I think it's the same. The best way to do it is to go and explore with kids. Do it with them because they're going to do it themselves, <laughs> you know? And to your point, Sharon, I think the thing for education here is you might find you have an explosion of tools, but you also might find that some, you know, sadly disappear because they were always vaporware to begin with. So we're going to start to see here, I think, tools that emerge that actually have real value to the people that matter most, to students, to teachers, and to parents. And those are the three biggies here. You know, schools and school leaders, we're just along for the ride. If you get the other pieces right, you know, then you have a super successful school and you actually have kids that are happy, are engaged, are prepared, are learning. And actually, to the point that Martin made, you know, why should we judge schools based on league tables and examination results? Start judging them on how many ventures do you incubate? How many hackathons do you hold? How many business plans are you getting? And I think as soon as you start to, to flip that script, we see an entirely new potential emerging. And it's going to be driven by Web3 and all that it entails. Great points made, Melissa. When I was growing up in university, if you didn't score 95%, you were no good. I think times have changed now. And like you said, we have to be judged differently. Let's go to Tom. Tom, you wanted to come in. Yes, I mean, first of all, Melissa, I 100% agree with everything that you just said. I mean, I'm totally on board. I think the way we scored education, with, you know, the way we reward education in the current archaic system is not actually helping uh, young kids. And to your point, Martin, and actually to the point that the question of uh, in the chat that Fadi asked, I think it's, you know, the question of, you know, um, physical classroom learning compared to online learning. I think it's important to remember that around 2.9 billion people from them, including 1.3 billion kids lack internet access around the world. You know, so I think a lot of kids, over 1 billion kids are missing, you know, the essential online resources for learning opportunities. You know, and I think I wanna highlight, for example, the GIGA project by UNICEF, which actually used Web3 to fundraise, philanthropic fundraise, to facilitate, you know, so the, the, this access to, you know, to kids worldwide. And the, the EGA project, if, if nobody knows about it, it's a project between UNICEF and the ITU, both UN agencies, um, that uh, want to connect by 2030 every school around the world to the internet. So you know, literally, you know, it's 2023, we are talking about AI and the wonderful things it's doing in the West. But uh, in Web3, but let's not forget that a lot of kids don't even have access to, I mean, there's literally no connectivity of internet in the schools, wherever they are in different regions around the world. And I think, you know, Web3, from a philanthropic perspective, at least Web3 and AI can actually help us advance that. And, um, you know, in order for all of us to enjoy online education, we need to have basic internet access, which in my perspective is a human right act, you know, necessity. Yeah. Martin, you want to weigh in on anything that Tom has said? Well, I want to say what Tom has said is in general. Um, you know, we're tossing around the Web3, right? And everybody has a different idea of what Web3 is. And we're talking about communities and, you know, there's there's a blockchain to it and so on. Um, uh, like everyone has a, has a different take. I, I personally, I think it's important to maybe reveal how is that going to play part. Now, personally, I'm seeing that, um, you know, Tom, you're, you're saying about internet not being accessible. I mean, which part of the world people don't have access to internet, really? That, 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 I don't want to challenge you, right? But I feel that from, from my perspective, almost everybody has a mobile phone. Yeah, the only place right now is maybe Gaza, but let's not go into politics, right? But basically, I know that people in Africa, they have mobile phones a lot. Um, the, the, for me... Um, it's that people don't have access to education per se, right? Even in the West. And this needs to change. Education should be inherent right. And so perhaps um, there could be a way uh, to have some sort of courses online uh, on, on, on the mobile phone that lead to a qualification that, that is meaningful. So I see that. I also see that 
perhaps um, uh, like one of one of the ways which 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 works today is to incentivize people by rewarding them with tokens. I think that would be wrong. Uh, again, I believe that the education um, there should be education for 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 the sake of actually gaining knowledge and and having the capacity and ability to or th there should be a capacity for the ability of someone to actually be able to learn to reach the education. I mean, today there are so many courses out there for free, but people don't even know that they exist, right? And what we have is the attention span the attention span is is waning you know uh, they, when i was a kid we were sitting at school they were drilling us with things that i don't even remember today yeah for sure most of it was useful and it led to somewhere i cannot deny education i'm really happy to be educated uh, but then uh, i personally i personally believe that um, there, there is perhaps a combination of something that is going to be uh, compulsory as, as we have today, so that we can have a, a gen general uh, general knowledge. But then some of the people who are curious might want to learn more. Some people may not. Uh, however, um, to, to learn is very tricky. You, you do require, I mean, this is something very obvious. You do require someone to teach you, right? And the best way to learn, I believe, is hands-on, uh, in person. Someone explains to you, you can learn very fast. And we all learn very, very quickly, I believe. Um, however, I would say that today what we are talking about here is is the fact that uh, there are now technologies that enable uh, the uh, imputing of, I don't know whether that is the correct English word, but imputing of the knowledge and mass through through courses that 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 that, that can help. So say if, say if I want to become a mechanic, maybe there's an there's an online course that is in VR or AR, and I can learn about that. Um, at a particular pace, then I will go to a particular pace. If I want to become a coder, right, there are courses that, that, that will help me and so on. And, and there are variety of forms. And I would say it's it's combinations, right? So it depends, it depends who wants to learn what. Uh, I'm learning in my line of work is uh, we, we, we have a gaming studio and a visualizing studio. And what we what we stumbled upon is that lots of companies including individuals spend enormous time explaining things effectively teaching about what they do whether it's your product and so on and so um the what we created is is a is, a, is, is an avatar a variety of avatars that are ai driven and so you can interrupt the lesson and ask things that are maybe outside of it uh, then then perhaps um, what i'm seeing is that what works is that at the end of it, you are asked a few questions to to show that you, you attend it. And then again, where Web3 could come here is that you might then receive a token, um, a proof of attendance, right? Which then may lead to a proof of competence. So say if I have completed several courses in cybersecurity, now I will then hold several tokens of attendance and competence. So when you're choosing me as a cybersecurity expert, you will see, okay, Martin has completed so and so and so and so, right? And um, th these days, uh, what, what I'm experiencing, especially the Gen Zs, they think that everything's on internet, right? If we switch the electricity off on the internet, people suddenly don't know anything, right? So what I believe is very important is to somehow ensure the the legacy of of a continu uh, continuum. Of, of the culture. And um, for example, we had the Alexandrian library burned down back in the day. That was a whole collection of, 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 of vast knowledge that is largely inaccessible. So what I would like to see is people collaborating and creating, recreating some sort of uh, library. That, that's an ambitious, uh, ambitious project that we also started. But anyways, uh, Let's just let's just stick to to the education and so on. I personally would like to respond to but to to what you were saying about how the technology is is going. Right, right. So we got five G today, and I believe the six G is knocking on the door. It's going to get even faster. The devices are going to get better, and within a few years' time, we are all going to have uh, augmented reality uh, goggles. Yeah, the, the next step is perhaps some holograms within your room. Um, yeah. So I mean. 
you might find some of the stuff what I'm saying controversial or somebody's like what he's talking about or whatever. It's just my personal view and how I see it. Uh, yeah, that's that's me. Yeah. Good points, Martin. Agree again wholeheartedly with everything that you said. Uh, Tom, you talked about accessibility. I think the other challenge in education is affordability. I have just put two of my kids through college in Boston. And thank God they've graduated. But let me tell you, I had to budget and plan for 10 years in advance to put them through six years of college. One of them is a postgrad. So can Web3 and AI make education more affordable? That's my question to the panel, starting with Melissa. So what I think we have here is, this is not about just placing a new way of working, a new way of creating, a new way of building, a new technology in. We actually have to fundamentally redesign the whole ecosystem. There's lots of money. <laughs> There's lots of money for education. Tom, I also do some work around UNICEF and FCDO about where money's moving. It's not about the funding, right? This is about how the funding is allocated. And we've moved beyond just funding bricks and mortar buildings because the future is not going to be all online. Um, you know, we happen to do at Sophia High School from four to 16, like incredibly well. You know, again, you don't become the first DFE accredited online school without designing the whole ecosystem but it will be hybrid. And I think as soon as we can start to see the different lenses that we need to be considering around the entire education story, you know, if we don't put money into capital builds, where can it be reallocated? How can we activate hybrid education and use technologies to provide high quality access to teachers that don't even have to be there in person um, to provide decentralization at scale for kids even in slums in India, you know, whose parents maybe can pay 20 US dollars, how can we start to work with private and state sectors to begin to move this entire ecosystem to actually address access, to ad address engagement, um, and then to address what fundamental skills are we doing? And I think if we start to think in, in, in that layer, and I'm sure, Tom, you've got some views from your from your side too about how this happens, then we start to see a world emerging that is hybrid and that provides this access that children around the world so desperately need, whether because you've never, um, you've never been able to afford education or whether because there's not been a school, there's no teachers, actually, or whether because you're in an area with conflict and crisis, you know, and there are something like 228 million, probably more children around the world who don't have access, 120 of those do, but they're not even reaching potential. So clearly what has been happening isn't working and it's time to redesign and create communities, you know, that are doing just that. So I'd love to hear your thoughts, Tom, on, the, on that point. Let me jump in. I mean, thank you, Melissa. Firstly, I really agree with you that, you know, a hybrid solution you know, is the way forward. I, I really think, you know, unfortunately, Martin, the statistics are the 1.3 billion kids do not have a smartphone, a, a, mob, a mobile phone for that matter, a computer or even access in, the, in their schools to the internet. So that is the statistics. I mean, saying that, I do think that to your question, uh, Rasha, Web3 AI can reduce the cost of education. And like Melissa said, there, there is billions of dollars being in diverted, unfortunately, to brick and mortar um, type of schools and to all systems that do not actually provide the, the necessary skill set for kids in this new day and age. And I think it's how do we use those billions of dollars in, in, in a more efficient way, you know, utilizing Web3 and AI to facilitate the necessary education like the Sophia School is doing. And I think, you know, another great example, if anyone is familiar with Mind Valley, it's a great uh, online platform for uh, skill set and education for any age all around the year um, with a valuation of close to $1 billion now. And what they have done, they have gamified the online course uh, concept. And they really, you know, they call it a quest where um, it's no longer an online course. It's a quest. Each quest is eight to 10 to 20 minutes. 
and anyone uh, can gain necessary skill sets. Uh, whether you are 20 years old, whether you're 40 or 60. And I think when we talk about education, it's not about just primary education for young, for young kids, but also for adults. I think, you know, Rashad, you talk about university in Boston for your kids. And the reality is that no matter which university you graduate, and some of us graduated a while ago, you still need to acquire new skills at all the time because technology is evolving, because the world is evolving. And how do we gamify education? How do we make it more accessible? And, and you know, whether it's a you know, subscription model, whether it's a hybrid solution, there's so many opportunities that uh, this new technology offers adults to. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, you mentioned Mind Valley, and I want to uh, talk a little bit about their business model. Uh, Vishen Lakhiani is their CEO, as most of you will know, and quite recently he moved to Dubai. In fact, he relocated from Malaysia to Dubai. So I've had uh, the privilege of uh, uh, kind of, uh, I got friendly with him. And the last time I met him uh, a couple of months back in Dubai, he told me that he has forced all his 400 employees to be AI literate. It's mandatory. So he's made all of them go through a course. And now he's planning a four day work week. Because he believes if everybody in his company is Gen AI literate, productivity will increase to a level where they need to work only four days a week and other three days are for their family life, for their well-being. So I think this is another topic that is gaining traction where the productivity increase that you achieve through technology can help you invest you know, your time in a, in a more healthy way. Because face it, today, if you talk of kids, they are addicted to their mobiles, right? Four friends go out for a meal. Nobody talks to each other. They are on their phones. It's an addiction. And mental well-being is a billion dollar industry. And I am kind of guilty of that because post-COVID, I was doing 10 Zoom meetings back to back. And there came a time when, you know, body and mind just refused to cooperate. And, and you start having uh, meltdowns, you have panic attacks, you have anxiety. So technology, I think too much technology is a bad thing per se. You cannot be eight hours in front of a mobile screen, the radiation will destroy you. And there is a very interesting study I want our audience, you know, to look at. This study is done by Ariana Huffington of Huffington Post fame. Now she runs a portal called Thrive. So she hired some experts who did a study and she proved that the radiation from all these devices that we are interacting with on a daily basis are actually frying our brains. I repeat this. Radiation that comes from these gadgets is frying our brains. And these you know, people will see this happen in the coming years. But we have to be very mindful of this now. So whatever curriculum we design, whatever method of teaching we adopt, we need to build this balance in life between being in front of a computer and taking a walk in the park. And sometimes I feel it's important for kids to go back to playing ball with their friends than going out and just being on their phones. Do you guys agree? I mean, this is a little off the topic, but no, I think it's a very important subject to discuss. So important. So important. And, you know, I think there's this word and that we can now play with. It can be in person and uh, centered around well-being and developing personal relationships and digital and the thing that we see in our school is, you know, again, it comes back to what do you think schools look like in the future? This idea that they're six hours and 48 minutes long is an industrial version. But technology provides the speed. It provides the scale. Why do we have to sit kids in that kind of static passive environment for this length of time when technology enables us to learn faster in smaller groups, for it to be micro, you know, we think about how the brain learns. I can see that coming up in the chat so that you can give kids back more time to do the things that don't require to be sitting with technology, their passions, their interests, their sports, their families, just being a kid. 
you know, we're using AI in the professional world to help speed up workflow. You know, if we just constantly replace that with more work, then we're actually not using it intelligently. So it's about finding ways to use it to become more human. Humans were never designed to be the machine, but the industrial layer has meant that we have, right? We just churn out jobs, basically. Whereas if we use it intelligently, we can connect back to that creative, that sense of discovery, that sense of exploration, enjoying the incredible world around us and doing so with the people that, you know, we love dearly. And I think that's such an important part when we think about it. It doesn't have to look like it does now. It's about creating space for the and. So it's so important. And finding that balance is really, really key. Yes, Tom, uh, are you implementing work-life balance? <laughs> Uh, personally, I am because I do agree with all of you that it's necessary. Uh, I do think that the you know brain health epidemic is actually affecting many kids within the you know the the pre-existing education system, and I, I think to be honest, is preventing many people from uh, enjoying life and enjoying the education available to them. Um, and I think, you know, technology with all its beauty um, also, you know, is in, a, in essence a Pandora's box because, you know, um, there are dangers for young kids and for all of us, you know, no matter what age you are, the way social media is built right now, um, you know, it doesn't contribute to one's mental health, which is why personally I'm only on LinkedIn and I haven't had any other social media account for many, many years because it's my way of controlling things. But I think like Melissa said, it's and, you know, it's it's finding the right balance. And I think this is something we also forget that we were never educated, you know, when we were young because it didn't exist social media. But I think educating kids about finding the right balance about the facts of how social media is built of how the algorithm is built, of how you know AI algorithms are built, the machine learning you know within Facebook, within um, Instagram are built to take advantage of their mind. And I think um, <laughs> it is it is a, you know top of topic, but I think it's very important. Yeah, Martin, you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, I'd like to say that um, that the that the dopamine hits are real yeah and people who are scrolling they're getting that uh i've deleted uh, several apps and uh, blocked the instagram have the timer on it and stuff like that uh, uh in my line of work i spent a, a huge amount of time in front of the computers and it's not that great i, I put a filter on it you know the, the the blue light filter and personally i believe that um that education should be absolutely inherent uh, inherent right uh, uh, alongside access to food water and travel and we uh, in the world have a long way to go however i believe that with the onset of the uh, artificial intelligence helping us as has it's been predicted 60 years ago and how many years ago finally we are arriving to the point where uh, a lot of different uh, jobs are being replaced, especially the low output jobs. Um, and so then perhaps there's an opportunity for everyone to maximize their output, to get better educated and so on. In the West, we are very privileged to actually have access to education. Not everybody takes it, no, everybody does it. And, you know, in fact, we have a job culture these days. Now, I believe that there will be a transition where still there will be some jobs and jobs will become an honorable um, uh, thing. So if I want to become a teacher, I'm going to perhaps receive more credits. And I believe that we might be going towards more um, um, just, uh, socially just system where uh, we have some form of universal basic income worldwide because the money is there, right? Uh, I feel very grateful for the fact that I have a roof of my head and fridge uh, is full of food and all that. But there are people around the world who don't even have clothes or let alone anything uh, to eat. And, uh, you know, so what are we doing? What are we doing about that? Then in terms of the education, what I would like to say as, as an example, I recently uh, went to a shop and there's three young lads 
arguing, literally arguing, uh, which mango is ripe. And I'm I'm looking at them. I'm like, is it is this what's happening really? I'm like, okay. And they approached me. They were like, excuse me, sir. You know, forty something. So I'm I'm an old guy for them. So it's like, excuse me, sir. We're trying to choose this uh, mango. Would you like to help us? I'm like, well, I thought about it for a second. I'm like, all right, let's. So what do you think? What does a ripe mango look like? The first guy goes green, dark green. The one, the other one goes, I think if it's half red. And the third one goes, I think if it's like a lot of red. And I'm like, well, look look at the world and try to describe them what it looks like. Eventually, I got them to come up with the conclusion that it would be the red color, which is the ripe stuff. I used the analogy of a banana. I said, how does the banana look like when you pick it up from the shop? Do you see it green? Does it go yellow? Okay, here we go. Right, cool. I believe that with the onset of education, everything we really should ensure that the core values that we have as a society are passed on so that we don't enter this idiocracy movie reference where people think that we should water plants with red balls. That would be my take on that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so a note for our audience, if you, there is a question from Gavin, which I believe Melissa, you are answering. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so audience, if you have, uh, I know you've been very active on the chat, but if you have a specific question for our panelists, now is your chance. Please put it in the Q&A tab that you see on your screen and uh, our panelists will be happy to answer your questions. And on a housekeeping note, I just want you to know that a recording and a podcast of this webinar will be available tomorrow at onlywebinars.com. Please share it with your family, your friends, your community for a wider reach. We want to reach as many people as we can. And the reason we do these webinars on a regular basis is to educate people, to educate our audience, to make sure you know everybody is up to speed with all the technologies that are being bandied. And of course, today we have uh, been restricted to Web3 and AI, but there are so many others, uh, you know, like uh, 6G, uh, Martin said is on the annual. That will be a game changer in itself. Probably mass adoption will start to happen. And uh, finally, the last point that I want to discuss today is how can we make learning fun? Because if you look at Web3, gaming, is at the heart of it, right? Immersiveness. So can we include that gaming and angle to education, not to dilute it, but to enrich it? Uh, Melissa, you, you have a take on that? Yeah, I think, look, the key to making learning fun is engage students in the story. What matters to student agency? What matters to them? What tools are they using? What tools are they interested in? Um, the sustainable development goals are a fantastic pathway because the, the kids of this generation, it resonates with them. And as soon as you begin to have that exp exploration with young people, you make time for these important conversations, you know, within the curriculum. As soon as that starts to happen, the next thing that occurs is because your students are engaged as educators or leaders, you think, oh, wow, you know, that, that let's let's continue with this. And so you begin to give them access to tools. You know, I, I posted in here, we, we gave our kids a, a, an SDG based building biodomes to create, you know, school houses to create a more connected community. And next thing you know, the kids, I couldn't stop them. I actually had to tell them off at 10 o'clock at night to stop sending me their Minecraft worlds and their Fortnite worlds that they've been building to create these connections. Like that is the holy grail. So sometimes it is about gamification. Sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's about tuning in to what young people are interested in and finding ways to build our learning and our curriculum pathways around it. And sometimes it's actually just coming back to foundations, you know, and actually different cultural contexts are really important. You know, do we need to be worrying about quadratic equations in areas where the fund fundamental literacy and numeracy skills are not even there? You know, again, it's this entire ecosystem realignment that involves students in the story. You know, bring them along as your greatest asset because they will always show you the way. And actually, you end up having a huge amount of fun along the journey. But to the point about gamification, for anyone that's ever stepped in to the immersive space, you know, the fact that children are so young people are so tuned in, right? They are plugged into the learning environment. 
activate that because actually you can make incredible things happen. Great. Yeah, there's, there's a question from uh, Michelle, and that's actually about how you can make it fun. And storytelling, I guess, is an essential uh, part around it. So I think, Michelle, your question has just been answered. And Shannon wants to know about the skills required to uh, transition for employment. I think, uh, Shannon, I can point you to this website that we launched a few months back. It's called AIUnplugged.io. Uh, if you go in there, you'll see a few reports by McKinsey and Gartner, which talk about the skill set that you need to have in the space of AI and Web3, which will help uh, further your employability. So do check that out. One is AIUnplugged.io, and the second one is Web3Unplugged.io. Quite easy to remember. And there are more than 300 reports there. So when you have a time, have a look. And there are a lot of learnings uh, that we've put under one umbrella. All right, so now is the time when I go around the room and give one minute or one and a half minute to each of my panelists for their closing thoughts because we close on the R. So let's start reverse. Let's start with Martin, Tom, and Melissa. Well, um, I would just like to say that um, the, the web free and AI is taking foothold. I'd like to answer that question there. What do I think about storytelling um, and and stuff? What I believe is it's you've got this immersive factor, you've got the storytelling, you've got the gamification, all that uh, in, in many ways. The, the most, most fact, most important factor is the interactive one where you engage in an engaging, in sorry, engagement module. And that way you can, you can then then again, gain a lot, a lot more, and um, it's about the the quality of the content. So there's variety of people are getting different content. If you go to a private school, the level of education is is compar uh, in comparable to what people get in a in a public school. It's it's, it's we should equalize that and focus focus on equalize that. And how does generative AI function? So uh, the 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 Emersa project, E M E R S A project, what we would like to create. Is, is interactive experiences that not only allow you to travel, but to change the course according to what you want to learn, how you want to learn. This is another important part, is rather than ramming down even force learning AI, is about what is it that you want to learn. Go with the flow, find what there is, and those are the opportunities. Uh, gamification is great for training for all sorts we're getting there we're going to see a very different fabric within five years time Thank and i see mind. a good future without consumerism yeah yes agreed uh, tom um i think i want to touch on the topic of gamification you know our foundation is building games on roblox on the sandbox and i think we are locating for other non-profits around the world to do the same and to meet, you know, Gen Z and younger where they are. And I think, you know, beyond learning skills, you know, at any age, I think also social impact and giving and being kind are important things that, you know, any generation and especially young generation needs to be aware of, needs to be part of. And I think it's important that we see from our perspective, more nonprofits using Web3, using AI, using immersive worlds to communicate their story, do their storytelling via a gamified way. And I think we've seen, you know, Roblox now uh, opening a couple of millions of dollars, or I think over 10 million or more in grants just dedicated to education, you know, and I think it, it's a brand new landscape when Roblox, one of the most, you know, biggest metaverses in the world right now, uh, investing in, in education, inviting educators to their platform, because this is where the kids are. And this is, you know, where, you know, we need to meet them. Uh, and I think it's up to us how to use AI, you know, for storytelling, how to use Web3 or beyond that uh, to, to advance, um, you know, the important causes we work on every year. Thanks, Tom. Melissa has the last word. Yeah, amazing. So I'll start with a personal insight. You know, one of the things, even though I'm a career-long educator, I've been ahead around the world, have had some, you know, outstanding schools that we lead. 
as a parent, one of the things I've told my own nine-year-old is if it's not happening in school, then come and explore it with me as a parent. So we do explore the immersive side. We do explore AI. You know, most recently I said to him, you know, Keenan, did you know that one of the number one Roblox builders is a teenager who built virtual hairstyles and he made 40 million US dollars after Roblox take their cut? And I said to him, if you can build a company on Roblox that makes $40 million, you know, even a couple of million dollars by the time you're 10, like in my mind, you've got all the education you need, you know, because you're already an entrepreneur. So don't be afraid to have these conversations. And if it's not happening in your schools, then actually as parents, we can go on those journeys together. And if you're in schools and frustrated as educators, there are lots of schools out there. Sophia High School is a really special, awesome environment. You know, as a maverick in the field, we've been able to build this incredible laboratory, but we open that up to show the what happens if story. And then as building out the hybrid ecosystem as a, you know, a for-profit company who, by the way, if you're interested, we're going to be fundraising so you can get in touch. Thanks, Sherrod. Um, it, the idea is we can be for profit and actually start to develop the humanitarian angle as well, the nonprofit arm, because the more of us that work together, the faster we can decentralize and scale. Actually, the more the more kids we can reach, the more educators we can find and actually keep in the sector. And I think the more that we'll be able to shift back, because let's face it, there is a global teacher crisis and educators are alongside doctors, you know, the, one of the most precious resources that we have for the future of all business. So if anything that we've said had resonated, you know, please, I've put my LinkedIn in, get, get in touch, would love to explore and show. And actually the number one people who share, you know, the power and potential are the kids at my school. And they are more than happy <laughs> to share that story, which is not how most of them began. You know, most of them began broken and beaten up by the education sector. And we gift that confidence back to them. So always happy to open the doors and introduce them to you. Thanks so much for having me, Sharad. It's been great. Absolutely. Amazing conversations. And um, I want to thank the audience for their time. And uh, I also want you to save the date for the next webinar, which is on 19th December at 8 a.m. Eastern. And I'm going to have a conversation this time with four futurists. And they are Rohit Talwar, David Wood, Alexandra Whittington, Perello, Loren. These guys can foretell the future. And it's as we close 2023, it's important for us to plan for our future. So it's good to talk to people who know. And we bring them to you on 19th December at 8 a.m. Eastern. So finally, thank you, my panelists, Martin, Tom, Melissa, great insights. Audience, uh, we'll catch up on the other side. And uh, thank you really, all of you, uh, for the privilege of your time. And I want to say bye from Dubai and have a great evening. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.